Welcome to the, the second module. Uh, in this module we'll actually be looking at remote sensing and how it works um, as a key data collection and data processing tool within Earth Observation Science. Um, my name is Stuart Finn and I'll be sharing this presentation with Chris Rolfsimer. If we have a look at coastal environments like the one in the diagram uh, to the right here, there are a number of ways that we can collect information remotely from that environment using Earth Observation Science techniques. As you can see in that diagram, we can put cameras and sensors on a whole range of platforms there. Each of the sensors is going to be collecting different types of information depending on the type of sensor and where it is in the environment. In the next couple of slides, I'll explain the key characteristics um, of the sensors and the different types of information they produce for looking at coastal environments. Chris Rolson is then going to explain how those are actually transformed into maps of the environment for understanding what's there and how it's changing. So one of the first controls on the type of information that we get out of sensors is the height that they're flying at um, and how frequently they come back to acquire information. This is a polar orbiting sun synchronous satellite that's collecting information uh, from the Earth's surface. There are two types uh, of um, satellite orbits which are used to collect information about the surface of the Earth's and coasts and oceans. The one that you saw previously, the Sun Synchronous Polar Orbiter, uh, was in a low Earth orbit uh, shown in the diagram on the right here. So these are between four and 800 kilometres above the surface of the Earth. Uh, it takes about 100 minutes for the satellite to go around the Earth and they can come back and collect images um, from every day to every two weeks. The images um, collected from geostationary satellites, which is the orbits uh, on the left there, um, tend to have much larger pixel sizes. Um, but we can collect images from every 15 minutes to half an hour. These satellites are typically 30 to 40,000 kilometres above the surface of the Earth and they stay looking at the same point on the surface of the Earth. When we have a look at the different characteristics um, of information collected from satellites at different orbits, this is what we see. These are a series of images collected over Heron Reef and its surrounds uh, on the Great Barrier Reef on Australia. The image on the far left uh, is captured uh, from a high spatial resolution, um, low Earth orbiting satellite, and we can see Heron Reef and quite a large amount of detail because the pixel size is around 2.4 metres. The next image to the right there is from the Landsat Enhanced Thematic Mapper satellite. Um, these sensors collect images with pixels of around 30 metres and cover an area of 185 by 185 kilometres roughly every 14 days. The image on the far right is from the MODIS sensor, uh, which is on board um, two NASA satellites. Um, these images are 2,500 kilometres wide, and the pixel size is from 250 metres to 1 kilometres. So you can see different satellites and sensors give you different scales or level of detail about the Earth's surface. The next critical dimension of the imaging sensors is spectral dimension. This is the type of or types of light that satellite and airborne sensors measure. Here we have a Landsat thematic map image of the Cairns area in North Queensland. Uh, it's got a large area of mangroves to the right of it. If we move to the panel on the right and we zoom in on that area of mangroves in the red box and we look at that image, what we'll see is each pixel in the image uh, is actually made up of six different reflectance values. And those reflectance values are from different spectral bands or different types of light. And we can take um, each pixel value and plot it on a graph to produce a spectral signature, which is the graph shown on the top there. And different features have characteristic spectral signatures, which Chris will talk about later as a basis for mapping. Here's an example of how we collect spectral reflectance signatures in the field. Here's Chris Wolfson taking a measurement over a calibration panel, uh, and he'll then be taking a measurement um, of the amount of light coming off the coral, which is right next to him. And that coral reflectance signature is represented in the top right-hand corner there. That's exactly the same type of information uh, which the satellite imaging sensor is collecting at each pixel in the image. Following from that last slide, here's an example of spectral reflectance signatures for a number of characteristic coastal targets. The x-axis of this graph shows you the different types of light going from blue wavelengths um, on the left-hand side through to red and near-infrared wavelengths on the right-hand side. The y-axis is the amount of sunlight reflected. There is a very dark black cyanobacteria shown on the bottom and bright white sand is shown on the top. Um, 
Materials with photosynthetic ability, so seagrass and algae are absorbing blue and red light and reflecting uh, some green light there as well. And there's an example of the different targets which we're looking at, the cyanobacteria in the lower left. The next characteristic is temporal. Uh, temporal refers to how often um, the satellite or sensor comes back over a specific area. This is determined by the height a sensor is flying at um, or by the orbit of the satellite itself. Some satellites come over once every day, some satellites come over once every two weeks. I'm now going to hand over the presentation um, to Chris Rolsimer who's going to take remotely sensed data and explain how that's transformed into maps. Stuart was just talking about characteristics of different um, of, of the satellite imagery. Uh, these characteristics we'll be using to uh, create maps out of it. The, for creating maps out of it, there are different approaches. The first one is the pixel-based approach. Where basically, every pixel is characterized by specific uh, signature, spectral signatures, as Stuart introduced earlier. If we know some of these spectral signatures, they know what it is, then we can look and compare other pixels if they have same uh, spectral signatures. On the moment we find them having the same kind of characteristic, then we're able to lab label them with the same category or color. Other ways to do it is an object-based approach, where segments are char characterized by groups of pixels by their texture and their color and their size. The next step in our objects-based approach is that uh, after segmentation we look in how to label these different uh, characteristics using their, their texture, the segmentation, the color, uh, the location and the biological characteristics. These types of maps are considered thematic maps. Then we also have the continuous maps. Continuous maps are a result of comparing uh, field data with the pixel values of an image and create a relationship in a, that for, uh, resulting in a model. This model is then applied to the whole image that results in an, uh, an image of estimated biophysical values. However, to apply these techniques we need to keep in mind the understanding of the marine environment. For instance, in this figure you see it on the left turbid water and there you can't see the bottom. So you won't be able to use optical or remote sensing to, to map that area map what's on the bottom. On the right you see clear water and there you will be able to do it. And then you have the interesting area in between where it varies, uh, where you have to deal with it. So to fill in the gaps and to help with mapping um, these environments, um, there's different ways to collect field data. This can be done by local knowledge or expert knowledge, where we talk with the local people who use that area or experts in the field of that area and try to get as much information as possible. Alternatively, we go in the field ourselves using a GPS floating at the surface to get a position uh, and then snorkeling or diving we write down what we see in that environment and it's a basic survey. We can also do de detailed survey where we conduct so-called photo transects. With these photo transects, a diver or snorkeler goes over the bo bottom, or a robot uh, follows the bottom and takes photos at regular intervals. These photos then are geo-referenced to the satellite image based on the synchronization of the camera and the GPS that floats at the surface. This can be done throughout the study area and as a result we get a lot of basic information of detailed information in the field. The field data is then used uh, for calibration but also for validation. So it's used as a reference data to look at uh, what the quality is of the image. Um, this can be a, for thematic maps that's in general an overall accuracy where uh, it provides a number that says something how good that map is. Or an individual map category accuracy for the individual uh, categories that are appearing in that map. For model data, we basically compared the field data with the observed of the field data as being the observed data with the model data and look at measured, uh, measures of difference or at the root mean squares.